Welcome again to our service for Clement Parish Church for this time for Sunday, the 1st of November. Uh, during the service in the first Sunday of the month, we'll be sharing in, in the Lord's Supper. And if you're wanting to join with us, then you should have um, your, your own communion elements with you. Um, if you don't at the moment, if we've caught you out with that, then maybe just hit the pause button and, and then you'll come back uh, able to, to take part fully. As well as myself, Gordon Palmer, Minister here, taking part in the service. Struan Robertson will be doing the Bible readings. David McLaren will be leading us in our prayers for others. And Karen Palmer will be with me um, for the celebration of communion. Right towards the end of Scripture, not just in the final book of Revelation, but towards the very end of that book. And um, the Apostle John writes this. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Let's join together in prayer, and we'll be gathering up the words of our prayers in the, uh, in the Lord's Prayer, the words of prayer that Jesus taught his followers. Um, the form of the Lord's Prayer that we use, um, the words for that will be on the screen. Let us pray. We thank you for that glorious picture of the risen Jesus, the ascended Jesus, the seated on the right hand of the Father Jesus saying, I am making everything new. And we thank you for that gospel, not simply a gospel that changes one or two wee bits and pieces, not simply a saviour who um, improves things slightly for us, but a salvation that's completely changing, completely transforming who we are and what we are in, in your sight. And we thank you for that solid hope of um, overcoming from the suffering and the hearts, that solid hope of being in a dwelling place where we're close to you, face to face with the, the living God, being his people, as having you, Lord, amongst us in all your fullness. Lord, today as we celebrate in these gifts of bread and wine, the 
speak to us not just of that death of Jesus in the past, but they speak to us and point us to that banquet in eternity when things have been made new, when Christ is recognized and confessed as all in all, and when there is no more the things that hurt and destroy. We pray, gracious God, that you will again affirm us in that hope as we worship you, as we gather around your word and as we share in the communion gifts. And we pray, Lord, that that hope will be a living hope in our hearts and in all of our lives, energizing and, and enthusing us to give you our very best. We don't come here, we don't gather in your presence because we have done our best or been at our best. Lord, in a whole lot of ways, we've fallen short. In a whole host of ways, we have let you down, let others down, let ourselves down. Gracious God, forgive us. Forgive us for all the sins that we've committed, for the good that we've omitted. And now, through your Holy Spirit, assure us of the reality of those words of Jesus, I am making everything new. And might we know and enjoy then the newness of being pardoned, of being forgiven, of being restored into closeness with you. May that help us to follow Jesus all the more faithfully. In his name and in his words, our Amen. Father in heaven. Save us from time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we've been having a short series on mission-shaped living, and this is the fifth, the final one in our series. 
The series has been rooted in the passage in Luke chapter 10 when Jesus sends his followers out two by two. We noted that he'd given them confidence about the where the harvest was ready. He'd spoken to them about connection, about not just throwing the word at them, but, but getting alongside people. He spoke to them too about continuing ministry and also last week we looked at compassion. And tonight, today we look at the, the fifth of these C's as well as confidence and connection and continuity and compassion. We look at the fifth C, which is conversion. That is that the message of Jesus is not just about tidying up one or two things, about a wee improvement here and there, but it was an announcement of the good news of the coming of God's kingdom. That was the message that Jesus took into the world, and it was the message that he gave his followers. And so we hear that message about Jesus sending them with the good news about the kingdom and the reading from Luke chapter 10. And then Struan's going to also read from, for us from Matthew chapter 13. Good morning. The readings this morning are firstly from Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 12. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him ahead to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out the workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lamb amongst wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating, drinking, whatever you give you. For the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick, and there are tell them, The kingdom of God has come near you. But when you enter a house you are not welcome, go to the streets and say, Even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than that town. Amen. The second reading is from Matthew chapter 13 verses 44 and 46. The Parables of the Hidden Treasure and the Peril The kingdom of God is like rescue treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Amen. I suppose there's quite a number of ways in which we talk about, people talk about um, converting or something being converted. Um, might talk about currency being converted from sterling into, into euros. Um, might talk about fractions being converted into decimals. And in these instances, and many more like them, the, the word means a, a transformation, a, a complete change. No longer is the money sterling, it is now euro. It's no longer is the number of fractions, it is now decimal. Of course, not every use of, of conversion or converting me, means that. And there is this really rather bizarre, bizarre game with a strange oval-shaped ball where if you kick it between a couple of posts and put it over the bar, um, then, then it's a conversion. But the try is still a try. But, but in the other uses, the more normal uses of, of conversion, it, it means that complete change, that complete transformation from one thing into another. Now, it's not a, a word that's used actually very much in, in Scripture. And in fact, in the New Testament, you could count all the references to convert in, in the fingers of your two hands. It's not a word that's found much in the lips of Jesus. In fact, there's only one reference of Jesus to Jesus using the word convert, and it was in a, a negative context. He speaks about the Pharisees getting, getting a convert and leading them further into hell. So Jesus wasn't going around saying, be converted, get converted. Have you been converted? His message was about the kingdom of God and the kingdom coming near, and, and also about there being a proper response to that, repent and believe the good news. 
And so at the beginning of his public ministry, we have it, in, for example, in Mark chapter 1 at verse 15, it's Jesus is announcing the good news of the kingdom and says, repent and believe. Matthew doesn't get around to that until chapter 4, after he's told us about the birth of Jesus and the baptism and the temptations in the wilderness. He then speaks of Jesus taking out this message of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven having come close. And even with that summary statement in Matthew chapter 9 that we looked at a few uh, weeks ago when Jesus looked at the crowds and saw that they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd, it was the kingdom of heaven's news that he wanted to share with them. And then Luke, in, in Luke chapter 4, after Jesus has spoken to Nazareth at the synagogue and after he's begun his ministry, um, people were wanting Jesus to stay longer in one place and he was ready to move on because he had to preach about the kingdom of God. Luke 4, 43. And then in chapter 10, at the first of the passages that Struan read for us, when Jesus has sent the disciples out two by two, again, verse 11, the message is not get converted, be converted, but the message about the kingdom of God having become close or drawn near. Now, the kingdom of God, as Jesus talked about and talked much about, is not a kingdom of this world that you locate in a place. It's not like the kingdom of Thailand, which is somewhere specific. It's not the, like the United Kingdom, not the kind of thing you find on a map. The kingdom is the sphere or, the, or where God's rule is acknowledged, where God is regarded and treated and served as king. Hence, its use in the, in the Lord's Prayer when we pray, your kingdom come, and then explain that with the next phrase, your will be done. And yet the prayer itself says where that will is to be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And again, it's not helpful, I think, to think of heaven as some, some place somewhere, but again, the sphere of where God's rule is, is, is seen in its, all its fullness and in its perfections. And the prayer is a longing for that perfection of God's kingdom, that fullness of his kingdom to be more and more real and more and more apparent on, on earth. Because this is not heaven. This is not the perfection of, of God's kingdom. Here there is still pain and there is still suffering. There is still death. The things that the verses from Revelation with which we began our service um, reminded us we would be taken away in, in, in God's kingdom, in God's final glory. In the meantime, we live in this, with the stuff of the hurt and unfairness and soreness of everyday life. But the kingdom of God, says Jesus, is breaking in. It's a kingdom which will come and change and transform things, and it has begun in the work of Jesus. Now, we're part in that kingdom. It's not something that happens just automatically. Hence, when Jesus, as we have in Mark 1, for example, when Jesus announced the, that the kingdom of God has come near, he said, repent and believe. There are things that we need to do. It is not the case that we live here in this mixed up, hurting and sore world and, and have our time here and then move on and graduate automatically into, into heaven. Jesus didn't teach that. It's not like, you know, being at primary school and then you reach a certain age and stage and then you move on to secondary school. No, we have to make the reality of the kingdom something that's real. We have to make heaven something that's real now. And that's the point that is being made in the two parables and the other reading that Struan gave, the, these two very short parables in Matthew chapter 13. There is a response called for now. Just three verses of Scripture, but two parables of Jesus. In the first of them, there's a man who's going across a field and he stumbles upon some treasure. He hadn't been looking for it. He didn't know it was there. He hadn't been seeking it. It's not as if he got out of bed that morning and thought, hmm, hmm, nice day. Maybe I'll go and look for some treasure today. Now, where's my metal detector? I'm sure it's somewhere. No, he, he wasn't thinking about treasure. He didn't know anything about it. It, just, it was there. He stumbled upon it. And when he found it, 
He went home and he raised everything he could, the money he could. He, he mortgaged the dog or whatever. I don't know what all he did to gather up the cash so that he could say, I must get this field. I must have it. I must buy it. In the second story, by contrast, it's a pearl merchant who's uh, uh, in, in the story here. Here's one who's been de dealing in pearls all his, his life. He's maybe been hoping that one day he, the big breakthrough would, would come and he would find this, this great pearl of, of huge value. And here he does, verse 46. That was something, as I say, he'd given his life to. He'd been training in this. He had maybe studied pearl merchantry at Jerusalem University. He might have been, for all we know, a member of the Royal College of Galilean Pearl Merchants. He was involved in this. And then one day, there's a pearl of great value. And just as the, the guy with the, the treasure in the field had gone and raised everything he could to to buy the field, he goes and gets everything, sold everything he had, verse 46, to buy the pearl. That is, both of them, notice, do something now. It's not that they find, the guy finds a treasure and says, oh, that'll come in handy one day. I might be able to use that sometime in the future. No, it might not be there in the future. He, he makes sure he can get it now. And the pearl merchant doesn't say, oh, there's that great pearl of great value. That's very nice. You know, that might come in handy. No, some other pearl merchant might get it. So he, he makes sure he gets it now. You see, both of them say now. And even as they're scraping everything together, even as they're um, <clears throat> selling this, mortgaging that, having a jumbo sale or a garage sale with all their, all their stuff, even as they're getting everything together so that they can buy the field or buy the pearl, they're actually feeling blessed because this is a great opportunity. This is something that's good to do. This is something that's, that's, that's a wow. Now Jesus is saying, in both of these parables, notice began in the same way, the kingdom of heaven is like. This is what the good news is. This is what the good news of the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew calls it, or the kingdom of God, as, the, as it's referred to in Mark and Luke. This is, this is the good news. This is something of great worth. And it requires a response now. The kingdom's not just some kind of nice idea, something that will... Yeah, come in useful now and again. Maybe some, like something that you would look at in a museum, spend an hour or two admiring and then get on with your life. It's not like some fantastic painting in an art gallery somewhere where if you're in the neighborhood, you'll maybe go in and, and have another look at it. It's treasure. It's pearl of great price. It's something to have and to have now. And all the more so, all the more urgent is this because the world is not simply going round and round and round in circles. The world is heading towards a time when God will judge. And he's going to say, what did you do with this good news of the kingdom? Did you repent and believe? Did you grasp hold of it when you had the chance? Now, the two stories, um, when we put them side by side, the man finding the treasure that he wasn't looking for and the pearl merchant discovering the great pearl, when we put them together, they, they tell us that, in fact, there are different ways of entering into the kingdom of God. One guy just found it quite out of the blue. It, it more or less found him. The other had been looking, searching, researching, seeking, trading, trying things, and then got him. But though they had come to find the kingdom in quite different ways, it was the same response. Sell everything. Go all out for this. Go all in here. And in a bizarre kind of way, I think in, over time, the church has turned that upside down, actually. The church has got that completely the wrong way around. Maybe not everyone that we know in church circles, but certainly for a large majority, it was the one way in. We started going to Sunday school, onto Bible class or whatever, youth groups took a membership vows. It was maybe or slightly different if we'd done it through one of the youth organizations. But, but by and large, the story of our kirk for the last number of years has been that. Folks kind of grew up and, and grew into it. And then, 
that one way in. After we were in, we then found all our different levels of response. Even the church saying, as it, as it used to do, you know, come to communion once a year and you can remain a member. That, choose that response, that's fine. But in fact, that, that's rubbish. That's the complete opposite of what Jesus said. What Jesus said is there's lots of different ways of finding the, the way into the kingdom. There's lots of different ways of finding him. Some people search and search and try and try. Other people, it just comes quite out of the blue and, and everything in between. There are almost as many different ways of finding Jesus as there are people. And yet the response is not choose your level, communion once a year or communion four times a year. Or the, communion, the response is to, to say Jesus is king and give him our all. It's to say live in the kingdom now. And so although Jesus didn't use the word converting or conversion, apart from that time he was um, having a, a set to with the Pharisees, this is in fact what he was talking about. No longer living in the kingdom whereby we please ourselves, but living in the kingdom where he is king and he is first. And he says live in that new kingdom now. Now if I was to go and live in the kingdom of Thailand, I would have to change some things about my life. <clears throat> I would have to use their currency. Bat, I think it is. You know, I couldn't say, take out a fiver or, or a 20 pound note and say to the, the shopkeeper in Bangkok, oh, you have to, this is money, pal, you know. Don't be racist here, this is, no, I have to use their currency. I mean, we have to learn language, certainly learn some customs if I'm not going to offend people. And I certainly we're going to have to learn to drive on the right-hand side of the road and not, not the left. And it's no good saying, well, you know, <clears throat> I might be in the kingdom of Thailand, but hey, I still want to hang on to my, my Britishness or my Scottishness, so I'll just drive on the other side of the road. No, if, if, if I go and live in another kingdom, then the, the ways of that other kingdom have to impact and will impact on me and how I do things. And in the same way that if we go and live in the kingdom of God, it was, so we have to put off all that's not of Christ, all that's not Jesus-like, and put on all that is Jesus-like. That is, it's a, a transformation. It's a conversion. It's a, no longer one thing, but now something else. Jesus is Lord then over all other claims and priorities in life. And so just as the conversion from sterling to the euro is no longer one thing, but now something else, just as the conversion from fractions to decimals is no longer one thing, but now something else, so the receiving of the good news of the kingdom, the repent and the believe, so the conversion is no longer one thing, Gordon Palmer pleasing Gordon Palmer and, and having all his responsibilities just as it seemed best to him, it is now saying Jesus is Lord. And these guys in the two parables gave their all for that. They knew the worth of that. There's a lot of things in life that are overpriced. The kingdom of God is not one of them. And so here's the call to be seeking and serving in the kingdom of God. And that was the message of Jesus. And it was a message that called for an all-out response as Jesus describes in these two very short parables. And do you or I have any indication that Jesus changed that? Did he, have we any indication that he's kind of toned that down? Compromised it? Has he said to anyone, well, live in my kingdom six months of the year and then go back to whatever else for the other six months? Has he said, live in my kingdom on Sundays, but the other six days, do what you like. As he said, live in my kingdom when it's straightforward and easy enough and you're in the right company, but as soon as people are laughing at you or criticizing you for, for believing, then, then you can just put it on. No, he hasn't done anything like that, has he? He hasn't said anything like that. The kingdom of God is good news even as they were putting everything together, even as they were selling all that they had, the guy wanting the field with the treasure, the guy wanting the, the pearl of great price, were thinking, yeah, but this is, this is worth it. God believes it's worth it. He hasn't given up on it, and he's working towards that glorious day that we um, 
found described in these few verses in Revelation with which we began our service. These promises about His kingdom matter to God. Do they matter to you and matter to me? Let's pray. Forgive us, gracious God, all the times we have tried to barter, all the times we have thought about negotiating and thought, well, I've done this, now I don't have to do that. I've served you in this way, and so I don't have to serve you in that way. Um, I've done my bit for this week, this month, this year, or whatever. We thank you that Jesus didn't do that on the way to the cross. Otherwise, he would never have got there. So we thank you for that all-out commitment that you have made and given to us and for us and ask, gracious God, that we might see and, and hear and receive that good news of salvation, that good news of, king, of your kingdom as indeed good for us. And might we, like the guys in the two parables that we read, realize that nothing matters more than taking our place in your kingdom and calling Jesus our King. Amen. In some well-known words in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, not seek 12th, not seek 17th, not seek 23rd the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. And we're going to sing about that in our next hymn, Seek First the Kingdom of God. And after we've sung the hymn, Dave McLaren will be leading us in our prayers for others. And then it will be the communion hymn, Behold the Lamb, as we approach the Lord's table. But firstly, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Is all saints day. Let's pray. For all the saints who from their labours rest, who thee by faith before the world confessed thy name, O Lord, be forever blessed. Father, this day we would thank you for all the saints, for those known to us and those unknown, for those who have gone before us, and those who are still with us. And in particular, we'd thank you for those saints who have encouraged us, who have set us an example, saints whose faces have shone, saints who have lived godly lives, saints who first told us the stories of Jesus and of his redeeming love. Father, we thank you for those saints, that great cloud of witnesses. And we thank you that we too can be a part of that. We pray that you would encourage us by your spirit to live those godly lives, to be that example. We pray that your spirit might loosen our tongues and enable and encourage us by faith to share the message of Jesus Christ. This week, Father, 
there is an election in America. We pray for those folks who have not yet voted. We pray that your spirit would guide them to make the right decision. We pray for those who would seek political office. We pray that there might be an end to the squabbling and the the libelous talk, that there might be an end to envy and greed and ambition. All of my hopes and plans, I surrender to your hand. Father, we pray that that might be their prayer. And we pray that whoever is elected, that they might be surrounded by saints, by godly people, by people who trust in you, who might be able to offer counsel, guidance, leading, direction. And we pray that not only America, but the world might be a better place because of good, honest, righteous leadership. Father, next week we remember. We remember the sacrifice of many, many thousands throughout the world. But we remember too that war is still raging in parts of the world. Nations are fighting against nations, seeking to dominate, seeking to impose their will. But there's other wars too. There is a war against poverty and hunger. There are divisions, fights within family. There's a great battle against disease. Father, we pray for those who would seek to bring peace in those situations. We pray for the scientists seeking cures. We pray for counsellors trying to bring families together. We pray for agencies in our town, in our country, throughout the world, who are fighting against this famine, hunger, poverty. We pray for diplomats who are seeking to bring peaceful solutions. We pray for these people. We pray that they might have the patience of saints as they seek to bring your will. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Father, it's our hope that there might be many, many who could be called your children. And later this month, Father, we begin the season of Advent. This has been a a trying year. It's a year when we've had to reevaluate our priorities. Things that at one time seemed important to us, we now know are worthless. And other things that we gave scant time to, we realise now are precious. As we reevaluate where we are, let us reevaluate Christmas and realise what's important about it. The message of God becoming man, Emmanuel, God with us. In our planning for Christmas this month, We pray that you might direct our thoughts, that you might guide us, that we might be open to your prompting, that we might find new ways, different ways of sharing the important message, the good news of Christmas with a world that's crying out for answers. And we pray that many might come to acknowledge you as Lord and Saviour. 
that many might come to be known as saints, saints of the living God. Father, we bring these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome then to the table, which of course is not Clermont's table, not the church's table, but the Lord's table. And all who love the Lord Jesus, all who have made that step of um, finding the treasure in the field or of buying the pearl of great price and who have given their, their all for Jesus are welcome to share with us in these gifts of, of bread and wine. Of course, it'll be whatever you, you have with you at home. But all who love Jesus and as they have made that step of buying and opting and giving themselves to and for his kingdom do share with us in this foretaste of the, the glory of that kingdom. Let us hear how the um, story of the, or the practice of the supper began as we were given it by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we pause, as we <clears throat> come to the table, we are indeed aware that we come um, from that context of a 
a hurting, a sore, and a troubled world. And yet we pause to recall that that's exactly where Jesus was on the night that he had that supper with his disciples. There was the trouble of the forces of evil being piled up against them, Satan ready to do his worst. There was the thought of betrayal, of desertion by close friends who couldn't even stay awake with them when he needed them. And so we remember and recognize that this is not a feast that is given to us because we are in some idealized place, because we are in some protected state, but rather as a meal that comes out of and reaches right into the hurts and the sorenesses and the injustices. And yet it reaches right in there and brings not just sympathy, not just I know how it is, not just I know what it's like, but brings to us the very body and blood of Christ, brings to us the sacrifice of a Savior who has given his all for us. And the Savior who gloriously three days later rose from the dead. And so we gather in the presence of a living God. And these gifts of bread and wine speak to us not just of the sacrifice of the cross, but also of that living God being with us, being among us, being for us. And so, Lord, as we do hear what Jesus did with his followers in the upstairs room, may your Spirit be with and among us and upon us as we take our gifts. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Of course, the, the Lord comes to us in His grace and we receive in faith. Let us confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed, the oldest and the most widely used of the Church's confessions of pray, faith. And so on that night in which he was betrayed, gathered with his disciples, our Lord Jesus took bread. And after he'd given thanks to God for it, he, he blessed it and, and he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this remembering me. And he took the cup saying, this cup represents a new covenant made in my blood, shared for the forgiveness of sins. When you drink it, drink it remembering me. So these then are the gifts of God and they're for the people of God. So take and eat the body of Christ and it was broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed that the sins of the world might be forgiven. Drink from it, remembering him. The blood of Christ. And let us pray. Lord, we thank you for every taste of your goodness. We thank you for every indication of your kindness and your love, your compassion toward us. And we thank you for these gifts. 
And we thank you for all that they bring to us. We thank you for all that they mean to us and for us. And ask that just as you have put your life in our hands, may we put our lives in yours and bring you glory in every way that we can. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So just before we conclude our service, some notices, and I'm afraid that mostly to do with folks who have died. Um, Jim Clark, the husband of one of our members, Margaret, Jim had died on the 23rd of October, but his, fri- his funeral is on Friday the 6th of November at South Lanarkshire Crematorium. And then two of our members, firstly Beryl Dixon, who had been in Lindsay Field House for a while, now got word of Ber- Beryl's funeral. It's to be on Tuesday the 10th of November at 9.45 in South Lanark Crematorium. And then just this week we had news of the death of one of the congregation's elders, Isabel Brown, who will be known to most, if not all of you, who have been associated with Claremont for any length of time. Isabel, and again we are waiting still on, on details of, um, for Isabel's funeral and we will let folks know um, as soon as we can. Um, we do commend these uh, folks, families and friends and uh, <clears throat> into your thoughts and prayers. And a reminder for those of you who are watching this um, live, as, as it were, that after the service, uh, join us at 12 o'clock for not in the large hall, bring your own tea or coffee or biscuit and cake and, and catch up with one another. We're going to finish singing our communion hymn, so uh, singing from verse 4. And again, after that, we will um, say the blessing. God be with you. Everybody. It'd be lovely to see more people on the, the chat after the service every Sunday. So please consider coming along and joining in with us. I think you'd really enjoy it. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>